Hello, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for your time. And welcome to the first, San Francisco's first welfare exemption workshop. My name is Holly Lung, and I'm a staff member at the San Francisco Assessor's Office. And I'm excited to introduce you to today's leaders and presenters of the program. You will hear from two agencies today, the San Francisco Assessor's Office and the California State Board of Equalization who will be guiding you through the qualifications and the application process for the welfare exemption property tax savings. Before we begin, I'd just like to share a quick housekeeping item. We will be filming, recording the first part of today's presentation. So we ask that you please um, just keep your questions until the second part of the program, which will be a one hour questions and answers session across the hall following the uh, presentation. So save your questions until the second part. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to the woman behind today's program, San Francisco elected assessor Carmen Chu. The work of her office helps provide over $3 billion in revenue for local services and public education. Last year, her office granted over $16 billion in property tax exemptions, including welfare exemption. Assessor Chu is continuously committed to providing um, improving services for the public, such as today's welfare exemption workshop. I'm really happy to introduce Assessor Carmen Chu. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. I am so excited to see all of you. I want to thank you for spending your morning here with us at the assessor's office. Uh, my name is Carmen Chu. I serve as San Francisco's elected assessor. And prior to serving in this role, some of you may have interacted with me when I served on the board of supervisors representing District 4 or the Sunset District. I think during that time, we worked a lot with many of the nonprofits uh, that are currently here in this room. Uh, we have seen many of your directors, many of your constituents, and probably some of you who've come to the board of supervisors advisors to advocate, to, to tell us about your good work. And I think more than anything, being on the board, we really do appreciate the good work that you do. It's not easy to do the work that you do. It's not easy to retain the talent and the staff to do the work that you do. And in particular, doing it in San Francisco makes things harder. And so one of the things we hope to do is to make things just a little bit easier by bringing this workshop together uh, for you. Uh, for many of you, you may or may not know about what the assessor's office does. And so so I want to share with you a little bit about how it is that we do our work. Uh, what you may know about our office is that we're always associated and tied to money, right? And so many people say when they see me, they're like, ah, the money lady, you know, but what is it and exactly how is it that we do that? Well, we do it by making sure that we are capturing the correct amount of value for property taxes across San Francisco County. Uh, in San Francisco, we have over 200,000 parcels of property, and each one of those has an assessed value that we use in order to capture property taxes. Currently, we have seen almost a 30 plus percent growth in our property taxes over the last three years alone. So when you think about that, our total, all of you add up all the assessment values of every single property in San Francisco, it all grew by over 30 percent in just three years. A lot of that is due to the big construction that you're seeing. A lot of that is due to the new condos, the buildings, uh, Salesforce Tower, the Warrior Stadium, all of these construction projects that are coming online that are adding value into our city and in turn creating revenue for us. Uh, in fact, over the last five to six years, we've actually exceeded our revenue expectations by over half a billion dollars. Uh, many of you probably have also heard that the state of California returned roughly $545 million in ERAF funding to San Francisco partially as a result of very, very strong property tax growth. So we understand in our office how important it is for us to do our job well so that the city has the resources to support not only our operations, but to partner with many of your organizations to provide the services we most need for our, our citizens and residents. That being said, what people often do not know about is that in addition to doing the valuations on properties, we also uh, administer our welfare exemption program. And so that is why many of you have come today. Uh, we understand that the welfare exemption process sometimes is very complicated. And 
even in this room, we have such a diverse group of uh, organizations that have so many different types of missions, whether it is to support our youth or to create affordable housing or it is to provide food for our food pantries. We have so many different uh, groups of entities and each one of you have uh, the potential to benefit from a welfare exemption, in particular if you own a property uh, in San Francisco. And so what we really wanted to do was to make sure that you understood how it is that we run our processes, uh, make sure that you know all of the deadlines that are coming, um, and also we have invited uh, to come today with us the State Board of Equalization. If I can ask them to raise their hand for just a moment. Uh, they are our partners at the state level who are part of the administration of the exemption process. We don't do it alone. We actually re rely on them to do a portion of the work, and then we follow up with the secondary uh, component. So we want to make sure you walk away with a clear understanding of how it is that we do our work. We want to make sure you put uh, faces to the names that you might be interacting with because we want to make sure you know that you can just call us and we can help you work through the process. Uh, and more than any Thing, we know that this goal, the goal of today's workshop, is really to make sure that you are successful. Uh, we in San Francisco can't do the things that we would like to do. We can't help uh, our most uh, needy community members or folks that have um, the need just a little bit of help uh, without all of you. And so I want to say thank you on behalf of the city and county, and we really look forward to making sure uh, to provide good information to you. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Holly, um, and I want to thank my staff in advance for their good work. Please know that in addition to this um, presentation that you're going to see today, we also have a separate um, area where you can ask one-on-one -on -one questions as well. Uh, so please know that if you don't get your questions answered here or you have a burning question, uh, it's not the last opportunity you'll have to make sure that you interact with us. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, we hope you have a really informative day today. Thank you. It is an honor to introduce our next speaker, a San Francisco native, a California constitutional elected officer, Honorable Malia Cohen. She's chair of the Board of Equalization. Ms. Cohen represents 10 million Californias in the second district, which is comprised of 23 amazing and diverse counties, such as San Francisco County. As chair of the Board of Equalization, she is responsible for ensuring that the $70 billion property tax system works in a fair and efficient and effective manner. Please join me in welcoming Malia Cohen. Thank you. Hey everyone, good morning. Okay, so I just got here by the skin of my teeth. I came in just from Sacramento just to be here to talk about my favorite subject, property taxes. So I just want to thank all of you for being here this morning. Um, I want to recognize Carmen Chu and her amazing staff for pulling this workshop together. And just by judging uh, by the number of folks that have come this morning for, for uh, questions and answers, it sounds like there's definitely a, um, a need that we are filling. And one of the things that I have learned, I've been in this role for one year now, is that few people know about either one, what the assessor is doing, or two, what the Board of Equalization is doing, until they're in trouble or until they need you. You know, it's just like a typical fair weather friend, right? They don't need you, they don't know you until they need you. So I'm delighted to be able to just to present a few things to you. Uh, as you heard in the remarks, my name is Malia Cohen. Many of you may recall I served eight years, hard time, on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and uh, just finished my first term as chair of the State Board of Equalization. And it's a really a pleasure to be here to be working with Carmen Chu and her team again. Carmen and I served on the Board of Super Supervisors together. And so to be here to talk about and to support the assessor's office to discuss uh, in discussing welfare exemption workshops, it's a privilege. Um, and I also want to highlight that the work performed by Assessor Chu and her staff to facilitate wel welfare exemption, it's actually truly important and very vital to our local government system. So this work is the, at the Assessor's Office, they make, um, they make sure that nonprofit organizations can continue to deliver their services at a cost-effective manner. And the way we participate in doing that cost-effective manner is by ensuring that there are um, 
people do not have to pay property taxes, and we know that San Francisco has a very high property taxes. Welfare exemptions are uh, vital to ensure that properties used for charitable, religious, uh, or hospital purposes are free from obligation to pay uh, property taxes. The law clearly states that. And so it's my pleasure to help start off this important meeting because the Board of Equalization um, oversees California's $70 billion property tax system. That's the second highest tax revenue generator for local uh, counties and local municipalities. The first being personal income tax, which brings in about $124 billion annually. So part of the Board of Equalization's responsibility in this process is to help facilitate and process organizational clearance certificates, which, establish, which establishes um, that your nonprofit or organization qualifies for the welfare exemption um, from property taxes. The exemption is unique in that it's co-administered by the county assessors as well as the Board of Equalization. And you'll have, there are two Board of e Equalization members here that are going to be uh, speaking, I think Tess and Brian, are you guys around? There you guys are, shout out to you. Go ahead, BOE. And um, so this is the two-step process. The Board of Equalization, first, we review the organ, um, we review the organization, making sure that you're eligible for the exemption. In other words, we're making sure that you're following all the rules and that you're operating exclusively for a charitable, hospital, or religious, or scientific purpose. Um, and, and then the second step comes in by the county assessor. Um, Ms. Chu's office determines if the organization's specific piece of property qualifies for the exemption. So later on today, you will have questions, and we will have answers. Um, we, as the Board of Equalization, specifically answer the question, is this specific piece of property being operated for religious, scientific, hospital, or charitable purpose? Now, I can go on and on and on. There are some good actors and bad actors, like in most cases. But let me give you some fun facts just to kind of set the tone. So in 2019, San Francisco Office of Economic and Workforce Development found that there were over 6,600 nonprofit organizations operating right here in the city and county of San Francisco, 6,600. It's quite a number. And these numbers tell a specific story. As of December of 2011, there are approximately 282 evangelical churches, 93 mainland, uh, mainline Protestant churches, 54 Roman Catholic, 27 uncharacterized churches, 17 Orthodox churches, 28 other religious organ organizations, 56 Buddhist temples, 17 synagogues, five Hindu temples, five mosques, four interfaith centers, one Shinto temple, and one Baha'i temple. And as you can see, each one of these religious organizations, if they meet the requirement of California's constitution, would qualify for a welfare exemption. So I'm really giving you these numbers to illustrate um, that the welfare, exem the welfare exemption um, is an essential part of the of maintaining California's charitable and spiritual health. Not to mention also our physical health and well-being when you think about hospitals and research institutions. So honestly, I'm delighted to be here. This concludes my remarks. Uh, it's great pride that I open up and we kick off that uh, this year's welfare exemption workshop. I hope you have a delightful day. Thank you, everyone. My name's Malia Cohen. All right, thank you so much. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panelists for today's presentation. From the San Francisco Assessor's Office, we have Derek Anin, he's a manager of public service and exemptions, and Nicole Agbayani, director of community affairs. And from the California State Board of Equalization, we have Brian Bagood, senior specialist property appraiser. Please give him a warm welcome, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so we want to kick off this morning by once again welcoming everyone. My name is Nicole Agbayani. As Holly mentioned, I'm the Director of Community Affairs for our elected assessor's office. We're going to start with the basics for you today, uh, just starting off with some learning objectives, what we hope for you to take away from today's roadmap on the welfare exemption. 
Um, so we are going to take you in great depth through the filing process for your welfare exemption. Uh, like we said, today's goal is to really provide you a roadmap step by step, working with both the BOE in Brian's shop, as well as our assessor's office here locally, and Derek will handle most of the technical pieces of that. We want to make sure to highlight for you key deadlines that you should have in your mind, both for filing for your initial exemption, as well as maintaining year over year. And then finally, we wanna give you guys a sense of what to expect from our office, whether it is a piece of mail or a deadline coming up. We wanna make sure that you come away with a good sense of what you'll be receiving from us, and also that you know very well where you can find all of us if you need any help along the way. So uh, my first slide here was just to introduce at a high level the county assessor function and then we'll go through a high-level definition of what the welfare exemption is. Chair Cohen and Assessor Chu had already done a lot of the work to introduce this, but just very quickly, California has 58 counties, so each one of these counties has an elected assessor, and the work that we do, although it's a county-level function, is uh, directed in a lot of ways at the state level. So first off, we follow the state revenue and taxation code. So that's the same across every county here in California. And second, we all share the same standards and oversight body. So this is the Board of Equalization. Um, so it, they make sure that we're standardized across the state. Here locally, we generate $3.3 billion in property tax revenue for our city on an annual basis. As Assessor Chu mentioned, this goes towards local services as well as public education. And our property tax revenue is actually the single largest source of funding for San Francisco's general fund every year. And finally, Assessor Chu went into this in detail, but just to reiterate, we have three core functions of what the office actually does. We are the assessor, so the vast majority of our staff do the work of valuing property uh, for each year's property taxes. Uh, we're also the recorder for our county, which means that we are the official record keeper for San Francisco County. We record over 400 different document types, and we do hundreds of thousands of these per year. And then finally, the function that everyone is interested in today, we grant exemptions. So as we've mentioned, we have a small but mighty team that does this work each year. Last year, they did the work to grant $16 billion in exemptions, and those exemptions go towards nonprofits like yourselves. They go towards schools, hospitals, churches, veterans, and many others who need this assistance with their property taxes. So now I'll take you through the actual formula for generating property taxes each year. Uh, so the generation of property taxes on an annual basis is actually a partnership. So it's a string of functions that are performed by multiple county departments, city and county departments here in San Francisco. It all starts in our office, the assessor's office. Our job is to determine the assessed value of all taxable property within the city and county. From there, we multiply that assessed value by the tax rate. So the tax rate is determined each year by our city controller. And that tax rate is 1% across the state. But here in San Francisco, it's usually a little bit over 1%. And that amount will fluctuate year to year, depending on the level of the city's bonded indebtedness. So once we have assessed value times tax rate, there are additional special assessments, fees, and liens that are added onto your bill. And now with those, they come from a variety of different sources and agencies. These actually do not have to do with your ad valorem taxes for your property, but they are voter approved measures that are tacked onto the bill in addition to the property taxes. And they're really put there as a convenient means of collecting all that funding in one go with one bill versus sending multiple bills. So ah, once we have all of this information, all of this is transmitted over to the treasurer tax collector's office. And their role on an annual basis is to calculate the bill, to send the actual bill out to the taxpayers, and then to collect the revenue. 
And so uh, we, we do this process on an annual basis. The following year, we start the whole thing again. Uh, and today, for the purposes of exemption, we'll be focusing the majority of our time on the work of our office and how exemptions go hand in hand with the assessed value. Thank you, Nicole, for that introduction and overview. Um, my name is Derek Onin, and I oversee the exemption unit here in the Office of the Assessor Recorder. So I want to kind of take this time to answer this next question. What is the welfare exemption? The welfare exemption provides a partial or full reduction in the taxable assessed value, which will reduce the amount of property taxes you pay for all real and personal property that is owned and operated exclusively by a nonprofit organization for a charitable, religious, hospital, and or scientific purpose. Now, let's take another look at this equation. This section right here is where the exemption is applied uh, to the land and improvements for real property and possessory interests. Or this is also the spot where the exemption is applied to business personal property items like machinery, equipment, fixtures, and leasehold improvements. All right, so before we get into defining the welfare exemption, I do want to talk you guys through the different property types that we assess here as an office. Um, there's three buckets that we think of when we think of different property types in our office. So the first one is probably what most people think of when they think of property. This is called real property, and this represents the land here in San Francisco County, and then um, the, the improvements or the structures and buildings that are built upon that land. Our second bucket is called business personal property. An easy way to think about this is that BPP, business personal property, is everything inside of that real property. So for you as nonprofits, that would be your desks, your computers, your supplies, and your fixtures. Um, the officially, the definition that we say here in the office is business personal property includes any tangible items like machinery, equipment, fixtures, and leasehold improvements held or used in connection with a trade or a business. All right, and the final bucket that we think about when we're assessing property is called possessory interest. Um, so simply put, possessory interest is when we use government property for a private purpose. But I wanna unpack that a little bit. Uh, it's the least familiar of the property types. Um, so as a state, California grants an exemption for government property, which is used for a governmental purpose. But in many cases, and in some of the cases of your own nonprofits, the government can be a landlord. And when they're a landlord, their tenant may be using that property for a private purpose. So I'll give you guys an example right here in this building. We are in a public library, a government building. But just outside this theater, there's a cafe that subleases a space. So with that cafe, our office would assess it because even though it's government property, they're using it for their own private cafe purpose. And we assess it and, and we would consider that taxable. So that is what possessory interest is. Okay, now let's take a look uh, and see how the exemption is handled under a real property assessment. So imagine this, you are a charitable organization and you now have a valid organizational clearance certificate from the State Board of Equalization. You should qualify for the welfare exemption if you are the sole owner and operator of that building. Quick question, do you share the space with other nonprofits or for-profit businesses? You may be qualified for the exemption based on the frequency and use by that other tenant. Are you also engaging in any other activities uh, this year? Some improvements, new construction, do, are you generating extra revenue, another successful fundraising event? Depending on where you are uh, with your renovation project, you may be qualified during the construction phase and for your revenue that you generate under unrelated business tax income during the year, this does not automatically disqualify you from receiving the welfare exemption for this year. Now. Now, same question and scenario, but now we're gonna take a look at how the exemption is handled under a business personal property assessment. Similar to real property, you should qualify if you are the sole user of the business personal property. Do you own multiple business personal property accounts? 
If the value of all your business personal property accounts are less than $4,000, then you should be receiving a low value exemption from our office. If your personal property value at any point increases and exceeds $4,000, no worries. Just remember to file your welfare exemption if you're using your personal property for an exempt purpose. Lastly, our business personal property division will assess other users on the personal property, and it is because of this, your welfare exemption will not extend to those other users of that personal property. All right, so now let's take a look at possessory interests. Just remember, possessory interest is government property that is used for a private purpose. Just like real property and business personal property, you should qualify if you are the sole user of that space. Same question applies to our possessory interest nonprofit groups. Are you engaging in other activities this year? Some improvements, new construction? Are you generating extra revenue? Another fundraising event? Always keep in mind, depending on where you are with your renovation project, you may be qualified during the construction phase, and the unrelated business income that you generate this year does not automatically disqualify you from receiving the welfare exemption. Mm -hmm. Just like business personal property, are other organizations leasing that space from the city? No worries. Our possessory interest unit will assess the users of that government property and it will receive its own separate assessment and it is because of this the welfare exemption will not extend to those other users. Okay, so I'm gonna start our next section of the presentation. We'll talk you through in much more detail how to apply initially for a welfare exemption. So Chair Cohen did a great job of summarizing this process, but I just wanna take it through visually here on a slide so that you guys can see that there are two agencies which work together, hand in hand, to grant the welfare exemption. So we start at the state level with the California State Board of Equalization. As Chair Cohen mentioned, what the state is very keen to understand is whether or not you as an organization are eligible to receive a welfare exemption. And the way that you work with the state is by applying for what is called an organizational clearance certificate, or in some cases, a supplemental clearance certificate. So once you've started your work with the state, you also work with us here locally at the county level, so you work with the assessor's office. Now we're looking for something slightly different than the state. Uh, what we are focused on is whether or not the use of your property is an eligible use for receiving an exemption. And the way that you work with us here at the assessor's office is by filing something that we call a first filing. And one very important note before we get into the details on both the OCC and the first filing is that your organization may not be approved for a first filing until you have approved, you've been approved for your OCC at the state level. Now I'm gonna pass it over to our colleague with the BOE, Brian, to talk you through the process for an OCC. Okay, good morning. So um, I'm just gonna briefly talk about some of the elements of an organizational clearance certificate or an OCC. Uh, there are a number of requirements and we don't really have time to go through all of them, but if there's one thing uh, you should take away from this, it's that you should file for it. Um, most nonprofits do qualify for this. The issue is usually they're just not aware of it, which is somewhat the purpose of today's uh, conference. So um, the welfare exemption is called the welfare exemption because it's for nonprofit organizations that provide for the welfare of the community. Um, more specifically, this is one of those requirements. It means they're organized and operated for qualifying purposes, which according to Revenue and Taxation Code Section 214, means charitable, religious, hospital, or scientific purposes. Charitable also includes certain educational purposes. Okay. Okay, so um, Nicole was mentioning a first filing form with the County Assessor's Office with the State Board of Equalization. Uh, we have our own versions of forms, uh, and so most of the organizations in this room will probably file the first one, BOE-277, for corporations and associations. If there are any LLCs here that uh, are meant to own property, um, that, that would be form BOE-277-LLC. Um, number two, it's this exemption, the OCCs are only for uh, nonprofits that are organized and operated for qualifying purposes. Again, most nonprofits qualify just by being what they are. 
Um, and again, LLCs also qualify if they are set up to just hold title to property um, in a qualified manner. Low income housing also qualifies, but that is uh, very complicated and we definitely don't have time to talk about it up here, but we'll be able to take questions after this. So just very briefly some tips um, when you apply. Most of uh, our filings are incomplete simply because they don't have a complete claim packet, so just some tips on that. Uh, include a, um, a copy for articles of incorporation, uh, all amendments. All of this is on the uh, forms themselves, and there's a checklist that goes along with it to help you, but just, just reiterating that. A uh, copy of your tax exempt status letter under uh, the IRS under um, Internal Revenue Code Section 501c3 or from the FTB under Revenue Taxation Code Section 23701b. A copy of financial statements. Um, if the claim form says audited or certified, if you have those, that's great, but otherwise just standard balance sheet income statements will work. Um, if you're seeking an OCC for 2017, we want one year prior to that to present. So that's 2016, 2017, et cetera. Please just make sure you um, describe the primary purpose of your organization and what you do. We are definitely gonna check out your website. If you just write C website, yes, we're going to definitely look at that. But it's very helpful for us to know in your own words what the purpose of your organization is and how you accomplish that purpose through your activities. And lastly, um, there's some specific language requirements uh, that the uh, code requires. Most organizations have to amend their articles to meet these requirements. It's not really a huge deal. It really boils down to just two sentences, um, just making you aware that that exists. Um, for LLCs, it's similar, but there are um, nine, basically nine sentences, nine clauses that they have to have. And lastly, once the OCC is granted, you are that's it, you're good with us. Uh, and unless we tell you uh, it's revoked or we need additional documentation and periodically every four to six years, your OCC remains valid. You do, you do not have to file with us every year like you might have to with the county. Um, and uh, well, actually lastly, four to six um, weeks is about our processing time right now. So I guess if there's a second thing you could take away from today, it would be to file and probably to file sooner rather than later because it takes a little while. All right, so now um, going back to the local level with the county, as I mentioned, your next step will be to file your first filing with the assessor's office here. Um, that form number, in case you're curious, is form 267. Um, and let's talk in more particulars about that. There's three steps that you'll undertake. So the first one is to fill out the form itself. We ask that folks fill out the form completely and fill out a new form for every new property for which you're applying for an exemption. After that, you'll wait to hear from our office. We will reach out to you and we will be reaching out to schedule an inspection. So remember what we're keen to learn from you is whether the activity that is occurring on the property is an eligible use. So it's helpful for our team to come out to your site to meet you and to see how it is that you are using the property. And the final step is to wait for a letter from our office. This letter is called a 267F, that's the formal name for it, but really what it is is a letter with findings that will let you know the outcome of your application. That letter will state the level of the exemption which our office has granted upon review of your application combined with your inspection. Derek's gonna take you through the particulars now. All right, thank you. Now I'm going to go over our first filing application for a welfare exemption. But before we get started, I know this is really small and difficult to read. So if you want to follow along with us, um, we have provided sample copies of the Form 267 in your packet. So I will begin. So I want to now go over some common questions that we hear daily from our nonprofits who are filing a welfare claim in our office for the first time. Um, for this slide and the next uh, few slides, let's pretend Derek's charitable nonprofit organization um, is up and running, and we have now, um, and now we have a valid organizational clearance certificate issued by the State Board of Equalization. This highlighted section is where you would write your OCC number that is issued by the Board of Equalization. If you are still in the process of applying for an OCC, just let us know. Remember, we can continue the application process with your organization but we will not be able to approve the exemption until you have a valid OCC. Now let's move on. 
That's Derek's nonprofit, uh, nonprofit purchased a new building on January 5th, but Derek's nonprofit started providing services to the community today. Today's date is what you would put on this line. This date represents the date that the exempt activity began. Remember, we are looking for your activity on the property. This can be direct services to the public, or it can be the start of your new construction project. Therefore, you would either list the, uh, the date uh, you opened your doors or the date that you broke ground on that construction site. Because uh, Derek's nonprofit is now up and running as of today, what, proper, what property types should Derek's nonprofit apply for uh, for the exemption? If, if, if Derek's charitable nonprofit is the sole owner and operator of the real and or personal property, you should just check all the property types that apply. This could be a combination of the land and improvements for real property, business personal property, or if you are operating on government-owned property, taxable possessory interests. Now, what do I do if I am the owner and operator of the real property, but I am sharing the space with another nonprofit? This highlighted section is where you would identify any other users of your property. Please note, by checking yes to this question, you will now be instructed to complete a supplemental form, uh, BOE Form 267O, and this form is used by our office to determine if the other occupants are covered under the welfare exemption. Now that we know a little bit about the other users, now let's move on to the other uses of the property. This highlighted section is completed to provide more information about your nonprofit's uses of the property. For each use, is it, it is very important to look out for the supplemental information and or forms that are needed when you check yes to a question. For example, let's go back to Derek's nonprofit. Uh, we provide low-income housing. Under question five, letter C, I would check yes, and again, I will be instructed to provide a little bit more information about the low-income housing portion of my property. By doing this, I would complete a form 267L, and this form, when it's submitted, is used by our office to determine the total number of low-income low housing units covered under the welfare exemption. Financial statements in this highlighted sections are required for all first filing applications. Remember to attach a copy of your operating statement or balancing, and balancing sheet, and if for any reason this is not available during the time you file your welfare exemption claim, just make a note here and let us know when it will become available for you to submit. Now, after you're all done, uh, you should not forget the most important section of the application. It is certification. Don't forget to sign and date the form before you submit. Remember, your application is not complete until this section is filled out. In general, the deadline to submit all of this information to our office is February 15th. That's the date you should always remember is February 15th. Why is the February 15th date important? Well, it's important for a reason, and that reason is um, if you do not renew your welfare exemption on time, you can lose your exemption and you will receive a property tax bill. That's why it's very important to remember that February 15th date. All right, so we'll take you through the process now for renewing on an annual basis. Um, so I think it's important for everyone to have a basic understanding of what our annual timeline looks like as the assessor's office. So I'm going to take you through some key dates, and then I'll let you know what to expect at different intervals in the year from the city. All right, so the, the first date, actually January 1st, we start the year with a date that we internally call lien date. So for any type of property that you might have, whether it's real property, business personal property, or possessory interest, our office will look at the assessed value of that property as of lien date, January 1st, and that is what we will base the property taxation upon. And now we just heard about this next date, very important for all of you. So this is February 15th. This is the exemptions deadline. You can start to see the rationale behind the timing there. So you will let us know that you are claiming for an exemption by February 15th relative to the assessed value on lien date of that same year, January 1st. Um, next, we have June 30th, which in our office we call roll close. 
Um, the time between February 15th and June 30th is our processing time. So to give you a sense, our exemptions team is working on an average of 3,500 claims during this time each year. And so once we've done all that work, we hit June 30th roll close. And this is essentially the date by which the assessor's offices across the state close their books with a completed property assessment role for our entire county. And that is the role that we furnish to the tax collector's office for the property taxation for the year. Uh, so now from here, the process bifurcates, and it depends on the property type that you have. Uh, that, will, um, that will direct what it is that you receive from us. So um, I'll go through them one at a time. I want to start with um, real property. So if you are an owner of real property, what you can expect is that in July, you will receive your notice of assessed value from our office. So this is a mailing you may recognize year over year that says this is not a bill at the top of it. That NAV will tell you all two things. It will have the assessed value for the property for that year. And it will also have the level of the exemption that you'll be receiving that year. So it's important that you check your NAV to make sure that you are receiving the level of exemption that you were anticipating for the year. Um, next, you receive the tax bill in October from the Treasurer Tax Collector's Office. And that bill is due in two installments, the first on December 10, and the second the following April 10th. So, so once again, this is what you would anticipate for real property. So for business, personal property, and possessory interest, it's a little bit different. The timeline for re receiving the notice, the bill, and having the bill due is shortened. So with this timeline, you can anticipate that you will receive your notice and your bill together, and that will come in the month of July. And then the bill is due sooner, so that bill would be due in August, just one month later. And once again, this is pertaining to business, personal property, and possessory interest. Um, so keep all this in mind. This is actually statewide. All of these dates apply. And so if you're operating anywhere in California, you can have this same timeline in mind as we go into the details of the annual process for maintaining your welfare exemption. So after you are approved for the welfare exemption, every year you will be mailed an annual notice to file for your welfare claim on January 2nd. After you receive your notice to file, you can submit your renewal to our office on or before February 15th. Now, you have three ways to submit, and the best choice is by email. You can email your claim directly to us at asrexemptionunit at sfgov.org. You can also mail it to our office, uh, make sure it's postmarked by February 15th, or you can visit our office during our normal uh, hours of operation, Monday to Friday, 8 to 5, uh, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Now, when you submit your, sorry, sorry. Now, when you submit your annual claim, please use uh, your annual claim form, which is the 267A, um, and use this form to note any changes to your organization for this year. Now, you would note any changes on this annual filing, again, by February 15th, and your annual renew form is where you're going to let us know that you are still requesting an exemption, and this is where you can note any other additional changes. These changes can be, for example, an increase in your affordable housing, housing units, um, a use of a vacant space, or a tenant is moving out of your location. This can also be changes to your organizational structure, um, changes to your articles of incorporation or bylaws, or you, would also, uh, you can also use this form to report any new construction in progress. So if at any point you, you have moved to a new location, um, you would Report that on your 267A, letting us know that you are no longer occupying that space, but at the same time, you would fill out a first filing application to now report the new location where you're operating. Oh, sorry. Okay. So remember, the notice of assessed value is mailed annually in July, 
and this is where you're gonna find your property's assessed value. The property's assessed value is used to determine the property taxes for the upcoming year. Lastly, for our business personal property accounts, don't forget to file your annual BPP statement in April, and this is the Form 571L. All right, and I should say, sorry, we should have said this at the top, but we'll be happy to send out this presentation to everyone. So don't worry, you'll receive a copy of all of these details. All right, so this is a question that our office gets on a really regular basis, which is, I've done my first filing, I've done my OCC, I maintain on an annual basis, so why, after all of that, do I still receive a property tax bill? Um, so to answer that question, I want to draw your attention back to this formula, which we discussed at the top of the presentation. Um, so as we have mentioned, we're talking about assessed value. And the welfare exemption that you've all applied for and that you work hard to maintain applies to that assessed value. So what that looks like with regard to this formula is that it will exempt your assessed value and thus remove the tax rate for your ad valorem taxes. But the welfare exemption does not apply to the additional special assessments, fees, and liens on the bill. So a reminder from that previous slide, these are voter-approved measures that are essentially added to the bill as a convenient method for collection, but they are not relative to your assessed value. Um, and so when you do receive the bill, it's these special assessments, fees, and liens that is what you're being charged for on an annual basis. All right, um, and I'll take you through a couple of images of the bill itself so that you know what you're looking at when you receive your bill. So first off, these line items here in this box that's highlighted, that is where you'll find your special assessments, fees, and liens. Um, so all of those charges are the voter-approved measures that you're still charged for regardless of whether or not you've been approved for your welfare exemption. Keep in mind that these are administered by a variety of different agencies. They're not administered by the assessor's office or by the State Board of Equalization. Uh, but if you have questions about each of these charges, the bill does include a phone number which you can call to understand more specifics on each of the things you're being billed for and if there are potential savings that you may be eligible for. And then while we have an image of the bill up, I also want to share where you'd look if you are looking to make sure you received your welfare exemption. Um, so right on this line here where it says less other exemption, that is where you should be seeing your welfare exemption applied to your bill. Um, so on this sample bill here, apologies that it's small, but this individual organization is not receiving a welfare exemption because that line is blank. And now I'd like to take this time to share some best, uh, best practices um, when you're filing your welfare exemption. So the, f the first one, advice on filing, submit on time or early before February 15th, and you can send your welfare exemption directly to us via email this can be your first filing or your renewal um, directly uh, to our inbox at ASR exemption unit at sfgov.org. Also, check your findings and don't wait for the bill. If you're filing your first claim with our office, this is going to be your 267F or the finding sheet. If it's a renewal, you're going to see this on your notice of assessed value that is sent in July. Um, you'll look at that exemption line. And last, uh, use our, off, uh, our offices here as a resource. Um, you can visit our website, sfassessor.org, 24 hours a day, 365, where you'll find forms, exemption, exemption information, property info, and recorded documents directly um, on our webpage. And if at any point you want to speak to a specialist, you can give us a call at 415-554-5596, or you could always come to City Hall and visit our main office located in room 190. Thank you, let's give our presenters a warm round of applause. Great. Thank you, so this concludes the first part of our program. We'll be starting our second part with the questions and answers session across the hall in the Latino room in 15 minutes at 10.15. Thank you. <laughs>